गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन एम आई ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टॉल ऑफ यू गाइज जस्ट कन्फर्म यू गाइज लाइक एम आई ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टॉल ऑफ यू ओके ओके फाइन थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू तेजेश थैंक यू वेरी मच वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू गाइज होप योर प्रिपरेशन इज गोइंग गुड या सो नाउ लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड विद द डिस्कशन रिगार्डिंग यू नो लाइक एज आई टोल्ड यू द एक्सपेक्टेड क्वेश्चन सीरीज हियर Uh, and uh, i i sincerely and you know i sincerely sincerely apologize for uh, the delay <clears throat> yeah sorry really 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 sorry guys uh, for the delay that has been caused due to some technical issues here so <clears throat> so now let's get started with this one here uh, now uh, my dear friends first of all let me tell you one thing here exam is very much nearby exam is on 4th june and uh, <clears throat> i hope your preparation is going uh, good uh, the main thing at this point of time is actually the revision of all the high yield concepts which are actually required for your exam to hum log ek kaam karenge like whatever uh, like uh, all the high yield concepts and which are like expected concepts for your exam so we are going to discuss that one guys okay so please uh, take a note of whatever i'm telling you right now uh all the points whichever i'm telling you right now please take a note of that one because these are like very very important ones and uh, they can be expected in your exams sir so starting with the first question here <coughs> all are true for the muzzle marked x in the given image here <coughs> except one hai na so let us see what are the true things regarding this one now why did i uh, kept this question here <coughs> Yes. Uh, why did I kept this question here? First of all, is yes. Uh, from the uh, tongue topic. Remember, from the tongue topic, definitely one question will come in your exam, sir. So in the next June exam, definitely a question will come from the tongue topic. Uh, so now in this one, the muscle marked X here. I hope you people are able to identify. It is a genioglossus muscle. This muscle will be genioglossus muscle, sir. Okay. and uh, in this genioglossus muscle remember number one point it is the largest muscle of the tongue yes absolutely true genioglossus is the largest muscle of the tongue it is also the safety muscle of the tongue yes it is also absolutely true uh, we all know very well genioglossus will be normally helping in protruding the tongue uh, it will not allow or it will prevent the tongue from falling back it is going to prevent the tongue from falling back so that is the reason why it is known as the safety muscle of the tongue not a true muscle of tongue no it is wrong here why because it is not genioglossus it is actually palatoglossus palatoglossus will be not a true muscle of the tongue sir not genioglossus and yes of course it is used for clinical testing of hypoglossal nerve i hope you all know that <coughs> yes i hope you all know that my dear friends that all the muscles of tongue will be supplied by which, which nerve hypoglossal nerve except the palatoglossus one which is actually supplied by vago accessory complex Now, uh, suppose if I have to clinically test the hypoglossal nerve, अगर आपको hypoglossal nerve test test करना है, तो I'll be testing with the help of this genioglossus muscle. Normally, what will happen? Genioglossus muscle will help in protrusion of tongue. Okay, so protrusion of tongue में help करता है, so tongue will come out straight outside. Suppose if any one genioglossus nerve is actually damaged, then what is going to happen? The tongue will be deviating towards the same side of the injury. The tongue will actually deviate towards the same side of the injury, guys. So that is the <coughs> <coughs> that is one thing that you have to remember here so yes genioglossus is used for the uh, clinical testing of hypoglossal nerve guys <coughs> so what i have done here <coughs> yes what i have done here that in all the options which are given there in all the options i have included like every point that you have to remember genioglossus is the largest muscle already asked in your exam it is a safety muscle of the tongue already asked in your exam and it is the one which is used for clinical testing of the hypoglossal nerve so all the points i have included at one place only 
and remaining general stuff uh, stuff you already know very well like about the muscles of the tongue and then the nerve supply of the tongue you already know very well guys hai na to tongue topic very much important and yes you can always expect the question from here in the june exam now please look at this diagram here in this diagram yes you are able to see all the extrinsic muscles of the tongue sir these are the extrinsic muscles of tongue so here you are able to see the genioglossus here and behind you are able to see the styloid process from this styloglossus from above palate palatoglossus and from below hyoid bone there will be hyoglossus so there will be genioglossus styloglossus palatoglossus and hyoglossus all these are the extrinsic muscles of the tongue sir so please have a pen and paper along with you and please keep on writing down like whatever topics you have to revise just before the exam so tongue topic definitely you have to revise before the exam sir next number 2 one thing which i have observed very closely is from last like 2 to 3 years they are constantly asking the questions on larynx about the cartilages of larynx about the muscles of larynx and their action and everything so that is the reason why i have included this question so that you have to revise that before the exam sir all are paired cartilages except <coughs> <coughs> yes all are the paired cartilages except i hope you all know very well yes larynx will totally have like nine cartilages out of that nine there will be three paired and three unpaired cartilages okay and the three unpaired cartilages will be which one the thyroid and then the epiglottis and the cricoid these three are unpaired and the remaining three will be actually the paired one that is arytenoid cuneiform and conicoid so arytenoid cuneiform and conicoid all these three will be paired except the thyroid thyroid will be the unpaired one guys and remember thyroid cartilage is actually one of the example of your hyaline cartilage only right <clears throat> yes so keep that thing also in mind the type of cartilage is over there then the next question here guys <clears throat> which of the following is the abductor of vocal cords abductor of the vocal cord now please look at this diagram here now in this diagram you are able to see here this muscle <clears throat> this muscle is actually the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle posterior cricoarytenoid muscle guys it is between the arytenoid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage so cricoarytenoid muscle and this one here will be the lateral lateral cricoarytenoid muscle lateral cricoarytenoid muscle guys and in this the best way to remember is with the direction now for example if this muscle will contract the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle will contract then what is going to happen if the muscle will contract it is going to take this vocal cords away from here sir vocal cords away from here so that is the abductor of the vocal cords that is only abductor of the vocal cords important one and apart from that because it is able to abduct the vocal cords then it is going to keep the airway patent the airway will remain like open patent so that is the reason why it is also known as the safety muscle of the larynx so both the, both of these questions has been asked in your exam take care about that one here so which of the following is the abductor of the vocal cord here that is the posterior cricoarytenoid posterior cricoarytenoid so basically my intention here is that <clears throat> my main intention here is that Okay, uh, like you know, you have to remember. Please make a note, like wherever you're writing, you have to recall or revise about the larynx topic, guys, about the muscles of the larynx and about the actions of the muscles as well as the cartilages and all. Next one, which of the following is true? Except which one, guys? Now, when it comes to neuroanatomy, I'll tell you one thing: your entire exam, your FMG exam, will not be completed. will not be completed without a section from the brain sir brain yes all the three sections definitely they'll be tested in your exam whether it is sagittal section or the coronal section or the transverse section of the brain so before your fmg exam you have to be like perfect with all the three sections and you should be able to identify everything over there in those sections is it okay so now <clears throat> before discussing about this question let us see the coronal section of the brain here itself guys so i want you all to become perfect in the coronal section here now in this coronal section yes first of all you are able to see here there is a lateral ventricle here and then there is a lateral ventricle here and these two lateral ventricles are separated with the help of septum in the middle and that septum will be the septum pellucidum now these two lateral ventricles will actually lead into the third ventricle guys the two lateral ventricles will be actually leading into the third ventricle via foramen of monroe now 
Now, first thing is the two cerebral hemispheres are connected with the help of band of this band of fibers. That is nothing but the white matter. Now, remember this bundle of fibers here with this bundle of white matter over here is actually nothing but your corpus callosum. Corpus callosum. Okay. So, the bundle of axons, the white matter connecting the right and left half will be commissural fiber and out of that the largest commissural fiber will be the corpus callosum. So, first you should be able to identify the corpus callosum there. And not only that, the corpus callosum is also going to form the roof of the lateral ventricle guys. The corpus callosum is going to form what guys? The roof of the lateral ventricle. Now, between the two lateral ventricles, there is a septum in the middle and this septum is known as septum pellucidum. And the most important thing is, if this is your septum pellucidum, for example, if my hand, <clears throat> if my hand is like septum pellucidum here, yes, just beneath that, the lower border will be attached to the fornix and that has been tested a lot of times. So, please keep in mind here, the septum in the middle is known as the septum pellucidum and the lower border of that will be attached to what guys? The fornix here. So, in the middle, you'll be having septum pellucidum and the lower border is attached with fornix. And uh, this is actually going to form the medial wall of the lateral ventricle. Lateral ventricle, medial wall is formed by the septum pellucidum as well as fornix. Now, apart from that, the floor. The floor is actually very much important, guys. The floor is important for every ventricle, whether it is like lateral ventricle or third ventricle or fourth ventricle. So, floor aapko na achse se padna bohut zaruri hai. Now, in this diagram, first, this will be the caudate nucleus, the head of the caudate nucleus. And below that here, this will be the thalamus part, the caudate nucleus and the thalamus. In between them, you will be able to appreciate, yes, there will be a vein that will be the thalamostriate vein. Thalamostriate vein will be appreciated in between them, sir. So, there is a caudate nucleus and the thalamus and yes, there will be a vein present here that is the thalamostriate vein, guys. Now, apart from that, if you are able to see here in this diagram, you will be able to see that there will be a network of capillaries and that is known as the choroid plexus. So, all these four structures, that is your caudate nucleus, the thalamus, the thalamus triad vein and the choroid plexus are going to form the floor of the lateral ventricle. Now, now why I am actually teaching you this one here? <coughs> now, why I am actually teaching you this one here? In one of your FMG exam, they have already asked in the image-based question, about the lentiform nucleus. There will be a lentiform nucleus here. So, there will be a caudate nucleus and then there will be a thalamus here and then there will be a lentiform nucleus here, guys. Fine here? The caudate nucleus, the thalamus and the lentiform nucleus here, guys. Okay? Now, between them, you are able to appreciate here, this is the white matter present here and this white matter here is nothing but your internal capsule. That's your internal capsule, guys. So, you should be able to identify all these structures in the coronal section of the brain. So, that is, as I told you, in the brain, yes, out of the three sections, definitely, definitely one section will be asked. Without that, the exam paper will not be completed. So, that is why you have to know this section here and you should be able to identify all these structures. Now, after seeing all these structures over here, welcome back, my dear friends. <clears throat> now, in this diagram, I hope you are able to see here, A is actually the caudate nucleus, absolutely correct. And this B here, it is actually thalamus, that is also absolutely correct. And the C here will be the lentiform nucleus, that is also absolutely correct. But D is not internal capsule, it is actually external capsule. Why? Because internal capsule is somewhere over here. So, that is actually external capsule, guys. Uh, lentiform nucleus. Lentiform nucleus is actually given the name as lentiform. Okay. Why? Because, yes, it is lens shaped. And because this lentiform nucleus is like lens shaped here, uh, there will be a capsule inside, internal capsule, and there will be a capsule outside. That is your external capsule. <coughs> is it okay? <clears throat> so, therefore, that fourth option is wrong. By the way, by the way, uh, it's not about this question here. It's all about the concept here, guys. I want you to remember about the coronal section. And I told you about all the structures in the coronal section here. Hope you're able to identify them, guys. <coughs> Done. Now, apart from that, now let us go to the next question. Now, this next question I kept here <coughs> in sequence. Why? Because, yes, this was the exact question that was given in your exam. 
this was a question that was actually given in your exam there guys uh, yes there was a radiological image and in that radiological image yes they have asked you to identify about the lentiform nucleus so i hope you'll be able to identify this one here in this one now the next ones guys benzodiazepine is actually asking about the internal capsule location see benzodiazepine oh, i don't know why people hide their names <coughs> Uh, internal capsule is exactly located between the lentiform nucleus towards the lateral side. Lentiform nucleus will be towards the lateral side, and the caudate nucleus and thalamus will be towards the medial side, sir. So, lentiform uh, internal capsule is between the lentiform nucleus and then the caudate and the thalamus on the medial side. Is it okay? Perfectly. That is the exact location of the internal capsule. Next one. Now, after this, yes, this is the question that was given in your MCA exam. You should be able to identify the lentiform nucleus in this one here, sir. Now, after that, let us go towards the next question here. <clears throat> okay. So, dheere dheere later on, uh, la later on, uh, actually, I'll tell you uh, about the other sections of the brain also. Okay. Na? Now, we have discussed about the coronal section in detail. I hope this is helpful for you guys. Okay. Next one. <clears throat> Now, injury to bulbar urethra leads to extravasation of urine in all except. This is this can even come like a clinical question also, guys. Even though I have given you very simple here, injury to bulbar urethra leads to extra, extravasation of urine in all except. I have just given you like a one-liner here. The same thing, we can actually make it like a clinical question. Tomorrow in the exam, they can ask you a clinical question. A person walking on the road suddenly falls down into the, you know, into the manhole and then he gets... Uh, hit in the perineum region and because of that the bulbar urethra is damaged similarly like you know uh, uh, a, a person sitting on the bicycle and riding on the bumpy roads so on the bicycle and riding on the bumpy roads at that time again they'll be hit in the perineum region and all so they can just make a frame a question you know a male aged about 20 years riding a bicycle on a bumpy road hits in the perineum region and bulbar urethra will be damaged something like that so instead of you know <coughs> just this one liner the same thing question can come as a clinical question also which is like very much very much like you know trending nowadays guys by the way let me actually tell you the concept here guys what is this bulbar urethra if it is damaged then what is going to happen where will the urine going okay exactly now please look at this image on your screen this is actually the male pelvis in sagittal section the male pelvis in sagittal section sir now in this diagram <clears throat> First, you are able to appreciate here that this one here will be the superior fascia of a urogenital diaphragm. I hope at this point of time when the exam is very much nearby, you all know very well what is a urogenital diaphragm. I have taught that very clearly, uh, yes, in the videos, in our doctoral videos and all. So, urogenital diaphragm and uh, pelvic diaphragm, most of the students will not have a clarity. Please remember that this is nothing but the urogenital diaphragm over here, sir. This one. Okay. Now, this urogenital diaphragm, it will be having like two fascia. One fascia above, that is the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. And then there will be inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. There will be superior fascia and then there will be inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. Then apart from that, yes, remember in the perineum region that there will be a fascia and this fascia is nothing but the superficial fascia. Be very careful with the naming here. It's not superior, it's actually superficial fascia. It's not superior, it's actually superficial fascia, which is also known as the colis fascia. Colis fascia bhi kehte hai, So better what you do is, you just keep it like very simple in your mind instead of getting confused here. Keep it like very, very simple in your mind, see guys. There will be a superior fascia and then there will be inferior fascia and then there will be superficial fascia. <clears throat> Let me write it for you here. This is the superior fascia of a urogenital diaphragm. This here will be the inferior fascia of a urogenital diaphragm. And this one here will be the superficial fascia of perineum region and uh, which is also known as the colis fascia also. It's called a colis fascia. 
So now if you just keep it like simple three lines here, uh, yes, the concept becomes so simple here guys. Remember, agar aap ye teen line yaad rakhoge na, if you're having like three fascia, how many pouches do you have in the middle? You'll be having only like two pouches there. And the naming of these pouches will be given superficially, hai na? So this one here will be the superficial perineal pouch and this one here will be the deep perineal pouch. So uh, there'll be like three fascia and out of that three fascia, in between the three fascia, you'll be actually having like two pouches here, sir. One is a superficial perineal pouch, another one is a deep perineal pouch, sir. Theke? So it's so simple, unnecessarily don't confuse yourself, guys. Now, welcome here. Now, in this, I hope you all know that the male urethra, which is approximately 20 centimeters long, the male urethra is actually divided into three parts. The one which you are able to see here, uh, passing through the prostate gland, this one is the prostatic urethra. And then this small urethra here, that is actually the membranous urethra. And the remaining, this one here, it will be actually the penile urethra. To be more specific, it is in the bulbar part of the penis, bulb of the penis. So, therefore, it is bulbar urethra. Okay. So, that is prostatic urethra, then membranous urethra and the bulbar urethra. Sir. Prostatic urethra, membranous urethra and bulbar urethra. Fine. Now, suppose if this bulbar urethra is damaged, according to our question, <clears throat> yes, in the clinical question, either the person, you know, falling in the manhole or uh, suppose there is an injury, while uh, you know riding a bicycle he gets a hit in the perineum region here and once he gets a hit here then what is going to happen here guys the bulbar urethra will be damaged if this bulbar urethra is damaged here then what is going to happen the urine will extravasate out the urine will go out the urine will go out into the superficial superficial perineal pouch apart from that the urine will also go into the thigh into the thigh also because that same fascia will continue down also guys. Apart from that, the urine will also go into the scrotal sac or scrotum. And not only that, the urine will also extravasate out into the anterior abdominal wall. The urine will also extravasate out into the anterior abdominal wall guys. So, you can clearly see here in the diagram, the fascia is actually continuous there. So, the urine will extravasate out into the superficial perineal pouch, into the thigh, into the scrotum, as well as the anterior abdominal wall. Fine. Now, now once you have understood this concept over here, yes, welcome back to our question, guys. Injury to bulbar urethra leads to extravasation of urine in <coughs> superficial perineal pouch, into the scrotum, into the thigh, but not into the deep perineal pouch. Not into the deep perineal pouch. And to just to complete this option here also, guys, yes, deep perineal pouch may kaise extravasate hoga if there is an injury to the membranous urethra. If this membranous urethra is damaged here, not the bulbar, if the membranous urethra is damaged here, then the urine will extravasate out into the deep perineal pouch. The urine will extravasate out into the deep perineal pouch, guys. <clears throat> Fine. So, I hope the concept is very clear now. Uh, so, one of the clinical conditions we have discussed here, guys, that is extravasation of urine. The urine is going out if there is a rupture of bulbar urethra or the membranous urethra. So, I hope it is very clear for my students. Or do I have to repeat this one? I think the concept is very simple. No? Don't complicate that. Uh, most of the time, what will happen? Pelvis and perineum topic, most of the students will not be studying properly. So, uh, they will not have a clarity in the concept there, guys. So, it's very simple. Keep it like simple, neat and clear, guys. Now, once this is done here, <clears throat> let us go to the next concept. Yes, one of the hot favorite concept of MC examiner. Nowadays, they're asking a lot about the axillary artery and the branches of axillary artery. So, I have given you a question here. You have to identify the branches here, guys. And, uh, you know, last year, what happened? Not only the, uh, you know, textbook image and not even the cadaveric image. In the exam, they have given the hand-drawn diagram of <clears throat> axillary artery hand drawn diagram of axillary artery uh, so axillary artery neither neither this you know textbook diagram was given nor the cadaveric image was given it was a, actually a hand drawn diagram which was given like last year so so thank god uh, always uh, i'm having a habit of making the students draw the diagram in the class as well as in our doctorials app also i will actually make the students actually you know draw the diagram with me 
तो दैट दैट हैज हेल्प्ड माय स्टूडेंट्स थैंक गॉड थैंक गॉड आवर हार्ड वर्क हैज पेड ऑफ है ना तो हम क्या करते हैं ना फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल विल ट्राई टू सी इन दिस डायग्राम एंड देन यू ऑल्सो एट द लास्ट मोमेंट हियर जस्ट बी फ्यू डेज बिफोर द एग्जाम वंस यू ड्रॉ दैट सो दैट इट विल एटलीस्ट एटलीस्ट रिमेन इन योर टेम्पररी मेमरी गाइज है ना थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरी now now my dear friends look at this diagram here now in this diagram this is actually the first rib here and this will be the outer border of the first rib sir and from the outer border of the first rib begins your axillary artery and that is going to be up to the lower border of teres major so axillary artery is extending from where to where the outer border of the first rib up to the lower border of teres major theek okay? <coughs> hai Yes. After that, my dear friends, look here. This is the rib number three here, and the rib number four here, and rib number five. And from here, there is a muscle going to begin, and that muscle will be the pectoralis minor muscle. Pectoralis minor muscle, guys. And that pectoralis minor muscle will go and get inserted onto the coracoid process. Coracoid process. Now, because of that pectoralis minor muscle, the entire axillary artery will be divided into three parts. the part which is present before the muscle muscle se pehle that is the first part of the artery the part which is present behind the muscle muscle ke piche that is the second part of the artery and the part present after the muscle that is the third part of the artery guys third part of the artery so one question which is possible here is that yes uh one question uh, which is possible here is that ki axillary artery is divided to how many parts three parts by which muscle that is your pectoralis minor muscle to pectoralis minor muscle will divide the entire axillary artery into how many parts sir three parts mein divide karta hai now now this will actually have branches and there is a beautiful symmetry here the first part will give one branch the second part will give two branches and the third part will actually give like three branches sir Now what what are these branches? Let me first of all tell you with the help of our diagram here, and I request all of you to please, please, at least on a rough paper and pen, you are writing the topics as well as please draw a diagram there, guys. Just make a note of all the topics whichever I am telling you in our expected question series here. Make a note of that, and please try to draw the diagram, guys, in the last moment. Uh, God knows it might actually come in the exam and it it might help you actually. So now, for example, if this is the axillary artery here. From the outer border of the first rib up to the lower border of teres major, this is the axillary artery, and this is the coracoid process here. And then what is going to happen here is that ये वाला आपका होगा pectoralis minor muscle. So as I told you before the uh, muscle, this is the first part. Behind the muscle, it is second part, and after the muscle, it is actually the third part, sir. First part will give only one branch, and this one will be superior thoracic artery. That is superior thoracic artery. It's very simple. This is our thorax, and first part is just here above the thorax, superior thoracic artery. Second part will give two branches. Please be very very careful how to identify in the exam. I'm telling you in the image based question. अगर आपको image based question दिया जाएगा exam में आप कैसे पहचानोगे? This branch is present towards the lateral border of pectoralis minor. Lateral border of pectoralis minor. Lateral border of pectoralis minor. And that is actually the lateral thoracic artery. lateral thoracic artery apart from that one more branch is given here and this branch is going towards here guys and that is thoraco acromial artery thoraco acromial artery that is how you have to identify so second part will give like two branches one will be the lateral thoracic artery another one will be the thoraco acromial artery very simple and third part will give three branches ye to aur bhi aasan it's much more simple Now the third part, what is going to happen? It is nearby your humerus bone here, and because there is a humerus bone there, one of the branch is going in front of that, taking a turn like this here, guys. Another branch is going behind this one here, sir. So what is the name of this branch here? That is your circumflex artery. Any artery which is going around circumflex and it is going around the humerus circumflex humeral artery. So there will be one anterior circumflex humeral artery. There will be one posterior circumflex humeral artery. It is going around the humerus here. and the third branch will be actually going down below the scapula so therefore this one here will be the subscapular artery that is subscapular artery guys so i repeat once more here the first part will give only one branch that is superior thoracic artery second part will give two branches lateral thoracic artery and thoraco acromial artery and the third part will give three branches anterior and the posterior circumflex humeral artery and subscapular 
and whatever feedback I got from your seniors in the last year, they have asked the question regarding axillary artery. And in this axillary artery, they have given the hand-drawn diagram exactly like this. Okay. And in this hand-drawn diagram, they have asked the name of these branches sequentially. Like for example, they have given like something like number one here and this one was number two here and this one was number three here. And they have asked the a name of these three branches in the options sequentially you have to answer like which is the first one second one the third one guys so the first one here is superior thoracic artery let's try and the second one here is the lateral thoracic artery and the third one here will be the subscapular artery i hope you're getting my dear friends so nowadays slowly slowly what is going to happen the standard of exam is increasing so better always always you know uh, follow like whatever the faculties are actually teaching you in the classes and whatever high yield topics are there because the standards are increasing here so you have to follow this one here so this is the another important topic another important concept uh, which i wanted to discuss with you guys now moving on to the next concept after axillary artery <clears throat> another hot favorite thing and a very old question and very important one also corticospinal tract is crossing at which level First of all, I hope you all know this corticospinal tract with another name, the very famous name of this one, that is the pyramidal tract. Sir. Corticospinal tract, it is also known as what guys? Pyramidal tract. And pyramidal tract, it is one of the descending tract. It is a motor tract and a descending tract. And uh, it is going to descend down from the cerebral hemisphere, the diencephalon, the midbrain and finally, in, yes, in the middle oblongata, it is going to cross. Okay. In the middle oblongata, yes, what is going to happen, guys? The corticospinal tract is going to cross. The 90% of the fibers are going to cross. Uh, so, therefore, it is crossing in the middle oblongata. But if you options, dekhoge, there is one upper medulla and the lower medulla. So, remember, the corticospinal tract is going to cross in the lower medulla. This is one of the hot favorite question asked repeatedly in your MC exam. So that is the reason why I have just included one simple question here. So that you at least revise that before the exam, sir. Before the exam, at least I will revise it. Okay, pyramidal tract crossing pucha jata hai. And uh, uh, instead of giving this word as crosses, they can even ask you pyramidal decusation also. The crossing is known as pyramidal decusation. So, pyramidal decusation, the crossing will take place at the lower medulla. Lower medulla mein, you know, crossing hoti hai, sir. Thikhe? Next one, sir. Next one. Yes, this was given in the last, uh, last year exam. Uh, this image-based question was given in the last year exam. Uh, one thing I would like to tell you here, nowadays, as, as you all know, guys, uh, most of the clinical questions are being asked in the exam. Along with the clinical question, integrated questions are being asked. And in integrated questions, what is going to happen? Yes, of course, anatomy is very well integrated with uh, orthopedics. Anatomy is very well integrated with surgery and other subjects like ENT, ophthal everywhere. And apart from that, yes, anatomy is very well integrated with uh, radiology. So, what is the kind of trend I am seeing from last two years? Be ready for that one is that. You know, they are giving the images in the form of, you know, radiological image only. But the question is mostly anatomical question. Okay. So, image is actually given uh, as a radiological image, but the question is mainly what guys? Anatomical image. So, please, please my dear friends, I would request all of you to remember that okay, you have to study all the subjects. Sare subjects padna bahut zaruri hai because integration may, no, uh, like they can ask you from any subject. So, that is the reason why. Remember, all, uh, you have to study like all the subjects here. Now, what is the artery involved in the hematoma shown in the given image? Now, in the given image is nothing but your, uh, yes, EDH. I hope you are able to identify it very easily there guys, EDH, epidural hemorrhage or extradural hemorrhage, you know? so this is the epidural hemorrhage or extradural hemorrhage here, fine, and yes, 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 idly shaped, uh, there are like various names to remember for that one, very good, uh, Dipe Sony, idly shaped or you know, the biconvex shape, lens shaped, something like that, and in EDH, in epidural hemorrhage, the artery that is actually involved, the artery involved in the epidural hemorrhage will be the middle meningeal artery. It is middle meningeal artery. Yes. 
Yes, of course, I'm really happy with uh, Jitesh Kumar also, Middle Meningeal Artery, which is a branch of Maxillary Artery. Yes, of course. So, Middle Meningeal Artery, and remember one more thing here itself, that Middle Meningeal Artery is going to pass through a foramen, and that foramen will be the foramen spinosum. We have discussed this one in head and neck topic about all the cranial foramens and uh, there will be a foramen known as the cranial, uh, that is your foramen spinosum and uh, through the foramen spinosum what is going to happen, middle meningeal artery is going to pass and suppose if there is a hit or any trauma in the temporal region over here, then what will happen? The middle meningeal artery will be ruptured leading to epidural hemorrhage. So I do have a comparative uh, image here guys. <coughs> So, in epidural hemorrhage, what is going to happen? The middle meningeal artery will be ruptured there. Whereas, in subdural hemorrhage, what is going to happen? The bridging veins are going to rupture there, guys. And uh, simultaneously, you will be also having the radiological image along with this one. <coughs> now, moving on to the next concept here. The next concept is given congenital anomaly is due to defect in. Again, as I said you, the image was actually given as a radiological image and you have to identify this congenital anomaly. So, before I teach you, can anyone just look at this uh, radiology image here and tell me like what is this anomaly guys? Yes, everyone here, first of all tell me like what is this anomaly here? Can anyone answer me here? <clears throat> yes, very good, very good guys, very good, I'm really happy, <coughs> very good Dipe Sony, very good Prashant. Actually, the image is actually showing you the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, okay. Now, in this congenital diaphragmatic hernia, it's due to what? Like, what is the reason for this one? To understand the reason for this one, first of all, you should know what will be the normal development of, yes, abdominal, abdominal viscera is actually going into that one. Yes, very good, very good. So, what is the normal development of the diaphragm? Uh, diaphragm? So, in anatomy, let me first of all tell you about the development of diaphragm. Remember, whenever you learn about development of diaphragm, diaphragm is actually formed by four structures. One is septum transversum, another one is the pleuroperitoneal membrane, another one will be the dorsal mesoesophagus, as well as the cervical somites. Okay, now. now, for example, if you are looking at this diaphragm, guys, developing diaphragm from above. Hai na? Our diaphragm is like dome-shaped and this developing diaphragm we are seeing from above. If we are looking from above, so, first, you will be actually having a septum here and this septum here will be known as the septum transversum. That is septum transversum and septum transversum is mainly going to form the central tendon. Uh, diaphragm is dome shaped, will be having a central tendon along with the muscular part, muscul muscular tendon structure there guys. So, central tendon, central tendon is formed by the septum transversum. Then you also have the esophagus here and then this structure which is coming from the dorsal side and encircling this one here. This one is referred to as the dorsal mesoesophagus. Dorsal mesoesophagus guys. And then apart from that the body wall, the mus muscular part, muscle part should be actually formed from somites. And remember, this is the place where most of the students will be confused. This will be derived from the cervical somites. Now, why I am telling you students will be confused here? All the foreign medical graduates will be confused here. Why? Because here diaphragm to yahan hota hai. Diaphragm is actually present between the thorax and the abdomen here. Hai na? <clears throat> but how come the cervical somites contributing to the muscle here? So, I will tell you one simple method to remember this one. Don't get confused with this word cervical. I have seen like many students in the exam. They will be like very much confident that cervical to hoi sakta hai. Cervical is not at all possible. Why? Because diaphragm is here and cervical neck is over here. Remember one thing, diaphragm is supplied by phrenic nerve. I will tell you the trick how to remember that one without any confusion. Diaphragm will be supplied by the phrenic nerve and phrenic nerve, what is the root value? <coughs> what is the root value of the phrenic nerve guys? <coughs> 
it is actually C3, C4 and C5. So phrenic nerve is actually coming from here C3, C4 and C5 and after beginning from here it is passing through the neck region and through the mediastinum and finally going and supplying to diaphragm here. Is it okay? So remember with this one okay, phrenic nerve is coming from the cervical region. So cervical somites are the one which are contributing for the muzzle valve part of the diaphragm. And whatever is left out here, this is the pleuroperitoneal membrane. Above, you'll be having the pleura, below the peritoneum, the pleuroperitoneal membrane, guys. <clears throat> so, this one here will be the pleuroperitoneal membrane and this one here will be the another pleuroperitoneal membrane. They'll be paired here. Is it okay? So, septum transversum, the cervical somites, as well as the dorsal mesoesophagus and pleuroperitoneal membrane. So, I told you the normal development of the diaphragm. Diaphragm ka normal development ho gaya. It is from all these four structures. Now, what is the uh, anomaly here, guys? What is the problem? Yes, this pleuroperitoneal membrane, agar ye form nahi hoga, if it is not at all formed, if it is absent, then what is going to happen? Yes, it will lead to congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So, the given congenital anomaly is nothing but congenital diaphragmatic hernia and this is due to the absence of pleuroperitoneal membrane. Pleuroperitoneal membrane. And during development, what is going to happen? The abdominal pressure more. And because abdominal pressure is more, all the abdominal viscera are actually herniating into the, yes, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the thoracic, thoracic cavity over there. And then they're actually going to compress the lungs, you know, all those things. So this picture gives you a very clear idea about the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, guys. The same thing is being showed in your exam as, you know, the radiological image over here. I hope this concept is extremely clear, crystal clear concept, guys. So, because this was already given in your MCA exam, so this is very much important, guys. That is why I have explained you the entire thing, the development of diaphragm from all the four structures, which structure is going to form where, where is the confusion, the confusion is the cervical somites over here, and then the application part of that one. So, agar pleuroperitoneal membrane absent hoga, if it is absent there, then it will lead towards a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Next one. Now, uh, as I told you that there are like so many questions being asked in the last two years, uh, two, three years from the larynx and pharynx guys, okay, constantly, constantly they're asking. So, one question from the uh, pharynx part also guys, let us see the pharynx fall apart. The Kalian's dehiscence is seen between what guys? Kalian's dehiscence is actually a triangle shaped like weak area in the pharyngeal wall. So, let us see it is between like which muscles? So, to understand that, I, I request all of you to please look at this diagram. <clears throat> so, pharyngeal wall, you all know very well, our pharyngeal, uh, the wall of the pharynx is actually muscular, right, uh, fibromuscular. So, it will have like longitudinal muscles also as well as circular muscles, guys. When it comes to circular muscles, <coughs> circular muscles are actually the constrictor muscles. So, you have got the superior constrictor muscle. So, this one is the superior constrictor muscle over here. And this here will be the middle constrictor muscle over here. And this below here, this one will be the inferior constrictor muscle here. But now, this inferior constrictor muscle in turn has got like two parts. Number one, you are able to appreciate here, this is the thyroid cartilage. And from the thyroid cartilage, these oblique fibers, which are going to the pharyngeal raphe behind, these oblique fibers, that is nothing but thyropharyngeous muscle. This is thyropharyngeous muscle, guys. Okay. And below here, there will be cricoid cartilage and this one will be the cricopharyngeus muscle. Remember the thyropharyngeus as well as the cricopharyngeus. Thyropharyngeus as well as the cricopharyngeus. These two will be a part of your inferior constrictor only. Inferior constrictor has got like two types of fibers there. So, these together nothing but inferior constrictor. Now, what is going to happen is between the thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus, there will be a triangle shaped weak area here, sir. There will be a triangular shape, weak area here. You can more clearly appreciate that from behind when you see the pharyngeal wall from behind. So, that is actually, that weak area is nothing but your Killian's dehiscence. And uh, whenever the pressure in the pharynx will be more and in the elderly people, uh, you know, normally what will happen as the age increases, the things are going to become like very much weaker. So, the pharyngeal wall also become very much weak in the uh, elderly people. And suddenly, suppose if there is increased pressure in the pharynx, then what is going to happen? From this wall, there will be a projection. There will be a diverticulum. That is known as what, guys? The Zenker's diverticulum. So, that weak area, there is nothing but Killian's dehiscence. And uh, the diverticulum that is going to come out from here, the outpouching, uh, that is nothing but the Zenker's diverticulum, which is going to outpouch from here, guys. 
ठीक है तो गोइंग बैक टू अवर क्वेश्चन हियर द किलियंस डेसेंस इज एक्चुअली बिटवीन विच टू मसल्स हियर वन विल बी द थायरो फैरेंजेस एंड द क्रिको फैरेंजेस गाइस थायरो फैरेंजेस एंड द क्रिको फैरेंजेस रिमेंबर दिस वन हियर ठीक है नेक्स्ट वन गाइस थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच तो दैट इज वन इंपॉर्टेंट कांसेप्ट दैट यू हैव टू रिमेंबर नाउ द नेक्स्ट वन दिस क्वेश्चन हैज बीन रिपीटेड लाइक यू नो टू टू थ्री टाइम्स इन योर एग्जाम अबाउट द विंगिंग ऑफ स्कैपुला the nerve involved in the given condition the given condition is nothing but the <coughs> the given condition the moment you look at a the diagram there you can easily appreciate yes sir it is winging of scapula and uh, winging of scapula yes what is the nerve involved it is the long thoracic nerve involved guys long thoracic nerve which is involved and this is the nerve which is coming from your c5 c6 and c7 guys okay na to winging of scapula the long thoracic nerve is involved and this nerve will be actually supplying to the a muscle that muscle is nothing but your serratus anterior muscle guys nerve to serratus anterior or else it is also known as what guys nerve of bell hai na to the long thoracic nerve which is also supplying to yes you know serratus anterior muscle serratus anterior muscle will be <coughs> Serratus anterior muscle will be attached to the upper eight ribs, guys. And when this muscle is going to contract, what is going to happen? It is helping in punching and pushing movements. It is helping in punching and pushing movement, guys. So that is the reason why serratus anterior muscle is also known as boxer's muscle. Us ko hum boxer's muscle bhi kehte hain. Now, right now, suppose wherever you are sitting right now, guys, wherever you are in whatever corner of the world you are right now. Suppose right now, if you and me, we are like normal people. If we push, agar hum isko push karenge, is na? If you're going to push against something, then what is going to happen? Our back will be absolutely normal. When you're going to push something, our back will be normal. But suppose if this long thoracic nerve is injured, the serratus anterior muscle is paralyzed. If this muscle is paralyzed, then what is going to happen? Ask that patient to push. When he's trying to push, what is going to happen, guys? Yes, this scapula will become like more prominent. The scapula bone will become more like more prominent. And if you want to remember, remember the medial border of the scapula becomes like more prominent, sir. to be more specific the medial border of the scapula becomes more prominent in winging of scapula so what is a nerve <coughs> what is a nerve damage here the long thoracic nerve and then the, what is a muscle which is paralyzed here sir that is nothing but the serratus anterior muscle which is paralyzed here okay now saying this i want you to remember like few things here guys this is the diagram of your brachial plexus i hope you all are like expert in the brachial plexus hai na now at this last moment just before the exam i don't have to teach you uh, like uh, um, all these basics and all to so, brachial plexus to aapko acche se pata hi hoga to so, number 1 the brachial plexus will be having roots here and then the roots will actually combine to form the trunk there will be three trunks upper trunk middle trunk and lower trunk and then trunks will divide into what guys divisions and divisions will combine to form the cords and cords will finally give you what branches they like five parts in the brachial plexus now in this i told you very clearly this is the c5 and the c6 and c7 and from there you can clearly appreciate that there is a nerve coming from here this is the long thoracic nerve and if this long thoracic nerve is injured it is leading to what guys winging of scapula injury to long thoracic nerve <coughs> lead to what guys winging of scapula okay and then uh not only this i want you to remember like other concepts from here suppose if there is a injury to upper trunk if this upper trunk is damaged injury to upper trunk will lead to herb's paralysis herb's palsy and in herb's palsy the very famous one the sign the sign is actually the policeman tip hand or else it is also known as the porter's tip hand or else it is also known as what guys the uh <coughs> policeman tip hand hai na waiter's tip hand so the policeman tip hand or the porter tip hand or the waiter tip hand okay the waiter tip hand it's actually the sign of herb's paralysis okay and not only that you also have to remember you also have to remember that yes what is going to happen at each and every point number one what is going to happen at the arm arm yani matlab yani shoulder joint par yahan par kya hoga so what is going to happen the arm will be actually adducted the person will not be able to abduct the arm he is not going to take the uh, take the arm away from here so the arm will be adducted and it is medially rotated then after the arm the next thing is elbow the elbow will be flexed or extended it will remember it will be extended there and then what about the forearm sir the forearm will be supinated or pronated remember it will be pronated 
it will be pronated and finally the fingers are actually flexed so arm will be adducted and medially rotated elbow will be extended here the forearm will be pronated and then remember the fingers are flexed that is completely giving the appearance of a policeman's tip hand or waiter's tip hand okay then the next thing is actually about the injury to lower trunk <clears throat> If this lower trunk is damaged here, if this lower trunk is damaged, then what is going to happen? It will lead to Klumke's paralysis. And what is the sign of Klumke's paralysis? The sign of Klumke's paralysis will be claw hand. The sign of Klumke's paralysis will be what, guys? The claw hand. <clears throat> In claw hand, I want you to concentrate on MCP, the metacarpophalangeal joint. Metacarpophalangeal joint between the metacarpals and the phalanges, this metacarpophalangeal joint will be hyperextended. <clears throat> and then this interphalangeal joint here, this one will be the flexed, guys. So you can also do along with me there, guys. Abhi ek bar try kiye <clears throat> making the claw hand. Metacarpophalangeal joint here, this will be hyperextended. And then the interphalangeal joint will be actually flexed. The metacarpophalangeal joint will be hyperextended. And interphalangeal joint will be flexed like this. It is flexed. Perfect. So, this is known as what? Klumke's paralysis. And in this Klumke's paralysis, what is this hand, sir? What is the sign here? That is claw hand. It's called kehte hai, claw hand, sir. So, injury to long thoracic nerve will lead to winging of scapula. Injury to upper trunk will lead to what, sir? Earth's paralysis. Injury to lower trunk will lead to what, guys? Klumke's paralysis. Okay, now. Uh, Abhishek Verma is asking, sir, how to differentiate between the partial claw hand and the hand of benediction? <clears throat> partial claw hand, yes, in the partial claw hand, the nerve which is involved will be the Allah nerve. And Allah nerve, yaha kya hoga, sir? only these fingers will be flexed here, like this. This is how the partial claw hand will look like. Whereas in the hand of benediction, yes, this will be normal, absolutely normal. You can easily differentiate that one. No? Partial claw hand, Allah nerve involved, hoga. Allah nerve involved, and only this side of the hand will be involved here. It will be something like this here. Whereas in hand of benediction, what is going to happen there? These fingers are absolutely normal. The median nerve will be involved. So, in that, what you have to do is you have to actually ask the patient to make a fist. Normally, those ka hat normal hoga. Hand will be normal. But what you have to do is, yes, you have to actually ask the patient to make a fist. And when he's trying to make a fist, right now you and me, we are like normal people. Hum look the so we can make a fist like this here. Yes. When you ask the pa patient to make a fist here, at that time what is going to happen? This is normal here. So, ye to se flex ho jayega, but this is not going to get flexed here. Because median nerve is involved. When median nerve is involved, all the five muscles of hand will be involved. That is your three thin R except adductor pollicis and the two lumbricals, the first and second lumbrical. So, these are gone here. So, this will not be flexed here, guys. So, normally the hand will be okay, but you when you ask, <coughs> when you ask the patient to flex or make a fist, yes, only this side will be flexed here and this will be remaining like this here, guys. <coughs> Next one, guys. Now, after this, after this, the next next condition here that we are going to see here. The next next condition or the next concept that we are going to see here is this one here. So, muscles involved in the lurching gait. So, basically, uh, yes, basically, basically what I am trying to tell you here is that, Basically, I am going to tell you what I am What I am trying to tell you is, please keep in mind, yes, nowadays they are actually testing about the partial claw hand and the complete claw hand and all the nerves involved in these conditions and all. They are testing on this one, guys. So, uh, please try to recall all these concepts like just before the exam. Why? Because in the last, last exam, just last exam, they have given an image-based question of partial claw hand. Yes, the partial claw hand, <clears throat> the nerve involved will be the ulna nerve, sir. Okay? Next one, another like hot favorite thing of your MC examiner. Yes, another hot favorite thing of the MC examiner here is about the muscles which are attached to the femur. Now, muscles involved in the lurching gait are inserted at. So, let, let me first of all tell you in detail about the muscles getting inserted here, guys. So, if this is the upper end of the femur, in the upper end of the femur, remember this one here will be the greater trochanter. greater trochanter 
and this one here will be actually the lesser trochanter. Lesser trochanter. And apart from that, yes, you'll also have a tuberosity here, and this tuberosity is referred to as the gluteal tuberosity, guys. Gluteal tuberosity. So there is a greater trochanter and then there is a lesser trochanter and then there is a tuberosity and that tuberosity will be the gluteal tuberosity. Okay. Now remember the muscle that will be inserting onto the greater trochanter. The muscle getting inserted onto the greater trochanter over here. This one here will be the gluteus medius muscle and then the gluteus minimus muscle. So these two muscles are actually inserted onto the greater trochanter and this was actually tested here in your exam and what is the muscle getting inserted onto the gluteal tuberosity here that will be the gluteus maximus muscle gluteus maximus muscle and on the lesser trochanter which was asked last year in the mc exam the muscle that is getting inserted onto the lesser trochanter will be the psoas major muscle and along with the psoas major muscle there will be iliacus muscle guys iliacus muscle okay so it is also referred combinedly as iliopsoas psoas major muscle and the iliacus muscle okay the gluteus maximus muscle will be inserted onto the tuberosity that is gluteal tuberosity medius and minimus will be inserted onto the greater trochanter and then the psoas major and iliacus at the lesser trochanter first you learn this aram se now now along with this you have to also remember like what is the nerve supply gluteus maximus will be supplied by inferior gluteal nerve whereas gluteus medius and minimus these two will be supplied by superior gluteal nerve you know gluteus maximus will be supplied by inferior gluteal nerve whereas medius and minimus those two will be supplied by the superior gluteal nerve and now let us come to the clinical aspect here when this superior gluteal nerve will be injured when there is an injury to the superior gluteal nerve here then what is going to happen these muscles are paralyzed and when these muscles are paralyzed the person will not be able to walk yes <clears throat> when this muscle is paralyzed here or the person will not be able to walk properly there guys so therefore the person will be walking with like you know his entire body lurching on one side so it will be like bending on the bending the body on one side and then walking so that 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 type of gait is actually known as what guys lurching gait isko hum kehte hain lurching gait sir so in lurching gait what are the muscles which is involved here gluteus medius and minimus and what is the nerve which will be involved guys that is the superior gluteal nerve and those muscles are actually inserting onto the greater trochanter here hope the concept is very clear so you have to remember where is the muscle attached which muscle is attached and you have to remember about their nerve supply and just you have to also remember about their actions so gluteus medius and minimus these two are actually helping in what they are actually helping in abduction at the hip joint they are actually helping in what abduction at the hip joint whereas maximus will be actually helping in extension at the hip joint so therefore my dear friends yes what is this sign what is this type of gait known as a lurching gait and what is the sign which is actually positive in this one that is your trendelenburg sign is actually positive guys so muscle which is involved in lurching gait will be nothing but gluteus medius and minimus gluteus medium uh, medius and minimus okay and uh, remember the gluteus medius and minimus they are actually attached at the greater trochanter so therefore the answer for this question will be the a That will be attached at A, sir. Okay. Yes, Abhishek Verma. Uh, in Trendelenburg gait, the nerve which is involved will be the superior gluteal nerve. Superior gluteal nerve supplying to medius and minimus. So, यहाँ पर medius and minimus attached होगा at A. Greater trochanter. So, at A, what is going to happen? Medius and minimus. Lesser trochanter is B here. Iliacus and psoas major, which was given last year. Okay. And then C here, gluteal tuberosity. The muscle attached will be the gluteus maximus muscle and d here is actually the ischial ischial tuberosity you all know very well the hip bone will have like three parts the the hip bone will actually have like three parts the ilium ischium and the pubis so the part which is present below here this nothing but the ischial tuberosity and ischial tuberosity is the one where the hamstring muscles will be attached okay and even the you know adductor magnus muscle will be attached so that is not a not a thing which has to be discussed here in the lurching gait fella part sir so my main intention uh, yes the my main intention here in this question here my main intention was i have completed like many concepts at one place here attachments at the upper end of the femur 
all the muscles which are attached to the upper end of the femur and those muscles and their nerve supply and action that is also done and at the same time the clinical condition that is lurching gait and at the same time Trendelenburg sign. So guys, I am telling you like this session is like very well planned session for all the important topics that you must revise before going to the exam. And I have concised it in such a way that uh, <clears throat> मैंने उसको ना इतना सिंपल वे में इसको कंसाइज कर दिया है कि इन वन वन क्वेश्चन इट्स आई एम ट्राइंग टू कवर लाइक ऑल दी एस्पेक्ट्स एवरीथिंग इन दिस वन हियर गाइस द मसल द नर्व सप्लाई अगर इंजरी हो गया तो क्या होगा व्हाट हैपन विद द इंजरीज एंड ऑल दोस थिंग्स एंड अलोंग विद दैट अटैचमेंट ऑफ द अपर एंड ऑफ द फीमर एवरीथिंग एवरीथिंग हैज बीन डन हियर गाइस ठीक है नेक्स्ट वन हियर लेट अस गो टू द नेक्स्ट कांसेप्ट हियर ओहो आइडेंटिफाई द एरो मार्क जॉइंट इन द गिवन इमेज Please write down. I hope you're having your pen and paper along with you. One question definitely on fourth June two thousand twenty-two from joints for a topic, sir. One question definitely, definitely, definitely in your June exam from the joints for a topic, sir. Joint pakka ek saval pakka aega, sir. Now before telling you about that joint, I'll tell you one thing here. Whenever you learn about types of joints. Whenever you learn about types of joints, sir, remember the types of joints. There will be like three types of joints, sir. One will be the fibrous joint. One will be the fibrous joint, sir, which is immobile joint. The fibrous joint is actually the immobile joint, guys, है ना? And uh, <coughs> number two, that will be the cartilaginous joint. Cartilaginous joint. And number three, there will be the mobile joint, that is the synovial joint, sir. So the fibrous And then cartilaginous, and then the synovial joint. First, what you do is have a clarity, have a clear idea in your mind, crystal clear idea in your mind that the joints are actually divided into how many categories, guys? It is divided into how many? Three categories: the fibrous joint, and the cartilaginous joint, and the synovial joint, guys. Now let us see the further, like you know, uh, sub classification or sub types of joints. Eh? Fibrous joints will be in turn divided into three categories here. Number one, the joint between the cranial bones, and between the cranial bones it will be sutures, है ना? And sutures are obviously immobile. Then after that, my dear friend, after the sutures, the next one here will be the joint between the tooth and the gum here, and between the tooth and the gum that is your gum fossas, gum fossas, and the third one will be actually the syndesmosis. Syndesmosis. Uh, that is actually a joint between the two bones with the help of like interosseous membrane. There will be interosseous membrane joining the two bones there. That is nothing but syndesmosis. And uh, you got to remember uh, one of the example of that one. That is your middle radial nerve joint here. The middle radial nerve joint here, and then inferior tibiofibular joint. Tibia and fibula ke beech mein inferior tibiofibular joint. So these two examples you have to remember for syndesmosis, guys. And the cartilaginous joints are again divided into two categories. One will be the primary, another one is the secondary cartilaginous joint. First, remember the another name of this one. The primary is also known as synchondrosis, and this is extremely important nowadays, guys. The cartilaginous joint. Why? Because they're asking many questions, many times they're asking. Okay, now almost every time they're repeating in the MCI exam about the cartilaginous joint. So first, you remember the another name there. The primary cartilaginous joint is known as what? Synchondrosis. And then secondary cartilaginous joint, it is also known as what here, sir? Symphysis. It's called symphysis. We get there. Now, now when you have to remember the examples, remember the examples of symphysis, the secondary cartilaginous joint. Uh, all the midline joints in your body, all the midline, midline joints in your body will be the examples of symphysis. So just remember one golden rule there. The golden rule here is that the midline joints are nothing but your symphysis, guys. And synovial joint, nothing but all the mobile joints, sir. All the mobile joints, um, like it includes all those things, like you know, the ball and socket joint, hinge joint, and then you also have that condylar joint, bicondylar joint, the plane pivot. All those joints comes under the synovial category. So the, this is the simple way how you have to remember, guys. Mohammad Rayyan, gomphosis will be between the tooth and the socket, between the tooth and the socket, gomphosis. Yes. <clears throat> Now, welcome to the secondary cartilaginous joint. I mean, I have already told you there. Already, I told you there. The secondary cartilaginous joint will be also known as what? Symphysis. And I told you, like, what is the golden rule here? How to remember the examples of the secondary cartilaginous joint, sir? Remember midline, midline joint, sir. 
तो नंबर वन द मैनिब्रियो स्टर्नल ज्वाइंट बिटवीन द मैनिब्रियम एंड द बॉडी ऑफ द स्टर्नम नंबर टू द जिफी स्टर्नल ज्वाइंट बिटवीन द बॉडी ऑफ द स्टर्नम एंड द जिफॉइड प्रोसेस नंबर थ्री द इंटरवर्टिब्रल डिस्क प्रेजेंट बिहाइंड नंबर फोर द प्यूबिक सिम्फाइसिस एंड देन द सेक्रो कॉक्सिल ऑल मिड लाइन यू कैन क्लियरली सी ऑल द एग्जाम्पल्स है सो इट्स ईजी टू इवन मेमराइज एंड रिमेंबर दैट वन मैनिब्रियो स्टर्नल जिफी स्टर्नल ज्वाइंट प्यूबिक सिम्फाइसिस द सैक्रो कॉक्सिजल ज्वाइंट ऑल दिस विल बी द मिड लाइन ज्वाइंट बट हियर रिमेंबर वन एक्सेप्शन The exception here, yes, all of them in the midline, but not the except the symphysis menti already even tested in the PG exams. This one here, mandible. This is the mental part of the mandible. Remember, it is not an example of secondary cartilaginous joints. It is not an example of symphysis. Remember this one here, symphysis menti. It has been mentioned in Gray's Anatomy, the latest edition, forty second edition, that it is a special type of fibrous joint. These are the exact words written in the Gray's Anatomy. It is a special category or a special type of, you know. uh <clears throat> the fibrous joint guys theek hai na so remember the best thing to remember about the examples of symphysis there is a secondary cartilaginous joint so what is the joint which is arrow marked in this diagram here in this diagram you are able to see the pubic symphysis and pubic symphysis is an example of secondary cartilaginous joints perfect easy to remember theek hai na <clears throat> okay done next one माई गुडनेस वाई हैव इंक्लूडेड दिस क्वेश्चन हियर सर तो जैसे मैंने आपको कहा आई थिंक आई आई होप यू पीपल आर एक्चुअली नोटिंग डाउन देर सर यू राइटिंग देर इन यू बुक्स देर के डेफिनेटली वन क्वेश्चन इज गोइंग टू कम इन द जून एग्जाम फ्रॉम ज्वाइंट्स तो ज्वाइंट्स एंड देर एग्जाम्पल्स यू हैव टू रिमेंबर दैट वन सर नाउ वाई आई हैव इंक्लूडेड दिस 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 क्वेश्चन हियर इज दैट इट्स इट हैज बीन द सेम क्वेश्चन हैज बीन रिपीटेड इन द लास्ट टू एग्जाम्स uh to last year like 2021 in the june exam as well as in the december exam this same question was repeated with the same diagram also uh picture also that is a radiological image of all your tarsal bones given there and in tarsal bones yes the bone which is marked there in front of talus this big heel bone here is actually the calcaneus guys above that there is talus here or talus ke samne in front of that this one will be the navicular so god knows uh, they might again repeat or they can uh, ask you about any other bone there guys hai na so that is the reason why in our classes in our videos and doc tutorial already I have made the student even draw the diagram for tarsal bones so you will be able to easily identify that is navicular sir in front of talus next one the nerve involved in a difficulty in eversion of the foot and loss of sensation in the dorsal aspect of the foot guys okay fine uh if you people have attended my classes um, anywhere guys whether it is on our doctorial platform or in the live face to face class agar aapne attend kiya hai to i hope you all remember my golden rule uh, about the five major nerves in the upper limb and about the five major nerves in the lower limb so uh, uh in the lower limb like the five major nerves whatever five major nerves that you have they'll be supplying to all the compartments in thigh leg and the foot Now, when it comes to the lateral compartment of the leg, in the lateral compartment of the leg, you'll be having two muscles. One is the peroneus longus, another one is peroneus brevis. In the lateral compartment of the leg, you'll be having like two muscles. One is peroneus longus and peroneus brevis, and these two muscles they are actually supplied by superficial peroneal nerve. Superficial peroneal nerve. It is the nerve of the lateral compartment. so superficial peroneal nerve is supplying to lateral compartment and these two muscles when they are going to contract what is going to happen suppose if this is our foot this is our foot the right foot and the left foot the right and the left foot they'll be having a medial border here and this will be the lateral border here elevation of the lateral border if you elevate the lateral border that is known as what eversion of the foot when you elevate the lateral border that is known as eversion of the foot and eversion of the foot is done by the muscles present in the lateral compartment okay fine and then uh, apart from that yes in the other diagram that i have shown you here all this which is highlighted here in the green color this skin here it is supplied by superficial peroneal nerve there is nothing but the dorsum of the foot so dorsum of the foot is supplied by superficial peroneal nerve and exactly the same thing is given here in this question here guys nerve involved in nerve involved in difficulty in eversion of the foot the person is not able to eversion do eversion of the foot sir and there is a loss of sensation in the dorsal aspect of the foot so what is the nerve involved it is the superficial peroneal nerve which is involved here sir 
the superficial peroneal nerve that is involved here guys okay now apart from that your mci examiner is also interested in the deep peroneal nerve why because deep peroneal nerve is the one which is supplying to only the skin in the cleft of first toe and second toe only that skin which is present in the cleft of first toe and second toe that is the first web space so deep peroneal nerve is the one which will be supplying to the skin in the cleft of first toe and second toe sir that is the the first web space and apart from that the medial side of the leg and the medial side of the foot that will be supplied by saphenous nerve and saphenous nerve will be the branch of your femoral nerve only and the lateral side of the leg and the lateral side of the foot is supplied by the sural nerve and sural nerve is a branch of which one guys that is your tibial nerve okay na so on the medial side you'll be having the saphenous nerve which will be supplying and it is a cutaneous branch of femoral nerve guys and on the lateral side you'll be having sural nerve the sural nerve will be the branch of your tibial nerve so please remember this one uh, by this we actually complete about the sensory supply to your food there guys sensory supply is also done here so superficial peroneal nerve will be supplying to peroneus longus and peroneus brevis that will be actually helping in eversion of the foot and then uh, the superficial peroneal nerve will be also supplying to the skin covering dorsum of the foot and deep peroneal nerve will be supplying to the skin in the cleft of first toe and second toe all this has been already asked in your exam please remember that sir next one uh now this is like a recent addition into your uh, mci uh mc exam like they are asking the questions regarding the thoracic duct this question um, like thoracic duct was not being asked before like you know 2 3 years back nahi pucha jata tha but nowadays they are asking about the thoracic duct also so yes i have also included this in the updated topics <clears throat> for you people in this session apart from that yes at doc tutorials also we are actually uh, you know i have uh, recorded for the fmg people like separately <coughs> all the updated topics which are required for the uh, next session that is your december session guys now first of all uh, what you have to remember here is that okay, what is the structure marked in this <coughs> image that is the thoracic duct here <coughs> the structure which is marked here is actually the thoracic duct sir and thoracic duct is actually going to begin from the cisterna chile in the abdomen you'll be having cisterna chile it is acting like a lymphatic heart all the lymph will be finally connected into the thoracic duct only there is cisterna chile so now what is going to happen the thoracic duct is going to cross the diaphragm so you have to remember i hope you all remember that very famous topic nowadays all the students are already expert in that one okay diaphragm actually has got like three major openings there are three major openings in the diaphragm so we all remember that very well with with the mnemonic as voice of america vena cava opening esophageal opening and aortic opening vena cava opening esophageal opening and aortic opening and aortic opening is the one from where the thoracic duct is going to pass at the level of t12 so aortic opening se wo pass hota hai it is going to ascend up and after ascending up it is going to deviate towards the left At a four, and then again further more ascending up, deviate again towards the left, and finally, if you are able to appreciate in this diagram, it's going to get yes, draining all the lymph. It is going to you know finally drain the lymph at the junction of this left subclavian vein here, and is the left internal jugular vein here, sir guys. So the left jugular vein and the left subclavian vein at the junction of that, it is finally going to when end or drain the lymph over there, guys. Drain the lymph over there. Yes. So remember the structure marked in the image. I I repeat all the points that you have to remember about the structure marked in the image there. That is thoracic duct, and thoracic duct. I want you to remember that it it is going to actually cross the diaphragm via the aortic opening, then deviate towards the left at T4, and further deviate and finally drain the lymph at the junction of subclavian vein and the internal jugular vein, sir. Subclavian vein and <coughs> jugular vein, sir. Next one. So all the points regarding that is covered. now another important concept about the upper limb topic which is being tested many a times in your exam is about the nerves which are actually related to humerus now look at this diagram here in this the nerve passing behind the mark structure the mark structure is actually the medial epicondyle here this is the medial epicondyle and what is the nerve passing just behind the medial epicondyle that is your ulnar nerve sir ulnar nerve is the one which is going to pass by the way i am not concerned about only the answer for this question let us discuss the entire concept here How many nerves are in uh, in total related to humerus bone, sir? 
ह्यूमरस बोन को कितने नर्व्स रिलेटेड होते हैं दे आर टोटली थ्री नर्व्स विच आर रिलेटेड टू ह्यूमरस दे आर टोटली लाइक थ्री नर्व्स रिलेटेड टू ह्यूमरस ठीक है एंड दोज थ्री नर्व्स विल बी नंबर वन द एक्जरी नर्व एंड नंबर टू द रेडियल नर्व एंड नंबर थ्री द अल्ला नर्व सो दे आर थ्री नर्व रिलेटेड टू ह्यूमरस द एक्जरी नर्व एंड द रेडियल नर्व एंड द अल्ला नर्व एंड रिमेंबर एक्जरी नर्व इज गोइंग टू पास बिहाइंड द सर्जिकल नेक ऑफ ह्यूमरस radial nerve is going to pass in the spiral groove or the radial groove just behind the shaft of the humerus and ulnar nerve is going to pass behind the medial epicondyle ulnar nerve is going to pass behind the medial epicondyle so axillary nerve is going to pass behind the surgical neck radial nerve is going to pass in the radial groove or the uh, you know spiral groove and ulnar nerve is going to pass behind the medial epicondyle so these three nerves are very much important extremely important concept for your mc exam and next june exam i'm expecting a question to come from here sir one question can definitely come from here also theek okay. hai next one sir next concept a 65 year old lady presents with a cerebrovascular accident involving inferior frontal gyrus which functional area would mostly be affected so let us see which functional area is present in the inferior frontal gyrus so let us like quickly have a revision of all the broadman areas for example if this is the cerebral hemisphere the superior lateral surface and in this cerebral hemisphere first of all in the temporal lobe in the temporal lobe you will be having two sulci two sulci if there are two sulci if there are two depressions there obviously how many gyri do we have like three gyri hai na if there are two sulci there will be like three gyri and you people know very well like if it is gyrus present there what is the name of the gyrus temporal gyrus so one will be the superior temporal gyrus another one will be the middle temporal gyrus another one will be the inferior temporal gyrus exactly the same concept you can also apply in the frontal lobe also guys here in the frontal lobe also we will be having two sulci so there will be three gyrus but this time the name will be the frontal gyrus so there will be superior frontal gyrus and then there will be middle frontal gyrus and then finally you will be having the inferior frontal gyrus now in the superior temporal gyrus in the superior temporal gyrus remember you'll be having area number 41 and area number 42 sir that is the primary artery area just behind that will be having area number 22 artery association area but when it comes to inferior frontal gyrus here here you'll be actually having the area number 44 and area number 45 that is broca's speech area and broca's speech area we know very well it is a motor speech area apart from that you also have the area number yes 39 and 40 here which is representing the wernicke speech area and wernicke speech area will be actually the sensory speech area sir wernicke speech area will be sensory speech area so coming back to our question here our question is actually about the inferior frontal gyrus in the inferior frontal gyrus you'll be actually having what part sir you'll be having the broca speech area so a lady presents with cerebrovascular accident involving inferior frontal gyrus inferior frontal gyrus what is the area that is a motor speech area sir which area will be involved here that is a motor speech area will be involved here sir now apart from that if you just want to want to you know uh, just complete this entire thing i hope you all know that there is a very prominent sulcus here known as central sulcus in front of central sulcus you'll be having area number 4 and area number 6 the primary motor area and the premotor area behind the central sulcus area number 3 2 1 that is nothing but your 3 1 2 that is nothing but the primary somatosensory area and then finally in the parietal lobe here you'll be having the area number 5 and area number 7 here that is the somatosensory association area and then yes in the occipital lobe here you'll be having area number 17 18 and 19 that is a visual area sir so you have to remember like three things whenever you're learning about the broadman speech area uh, sorry broadman areas whenever you learning about the broadband areas remember three things focus on three things the name of the area the number of the area and the location of the area the name number and location guys name number and location okay so name is important number is important location is important sir okay fine here uh Yes, yes, of course, of course. Jyoti Singh, the Broca speech area is actually the motor, whereas Wernicke will be the sensory speech area. Wernicke will be sensory speech area. Fine. Now the next thing is about the left recurrent laryngeal nerve has a comparatively longer course due to the persistence of which pharyngeal arch artery. 
actually na my 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 concern here is that we all know very well there will be a right recurrent laryngeal and there will be a left recurrent laryngeal rln rln right side and the left side now remember the left side it is like more longer why because the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is actually going to arch around what it is going to arch around the arch of aorta whereas the right one is going to arch around actually the subclavian subclavian artery so in this diagram you can clearly see this is the right subclavian artery here and this is the right recurrent laryngeal nerve it is going to arch around that one uh, whereas uh, this one here if you are able to appreciate is the aorta arch of aorta or वहां पर आपको नजर आएगा the left recurrent laryngeal nerve guys so it is like more longer okay uh now my dear doctors remember my main intention my students all my foreign medical graduates you know very well you know very well about this right and left recurrent laryngeal nerve it is also discussed in the ENT also okay and ENT yes be ready tomorrow like uh, uh Dr Rajiv Dhawan sir will be taking the you know ENT session for you like expected questions for this FMG exam also hai na so yes ENT sir ne bhi aapke sath mein discuss kiya hoga about RLN fine but now my concern is about the development of arch arteries and this is being tested constantly in your fmg exam and most of the students are not studying embryology properly guys so please i request all of you ye padhna bahut 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 zaruri hai sir it's very much important that you study this very clearly now listen here i hope you people at least know the name that is your pharyngeal arches how many pharyngeal arches do you have sir during development aapne embryo ka picture dekha hoga Yes, <clears throat> there will be like six pharyngeal arches over here. Six pharyngeal arches over here. So in that ar pharyngeal arches, if there are, so arches will also have the arteries, guys. Arch arteries will be there. There will be six pharyngeal arches, and those arches will actually have the arch arteries also. There will be six arch arteries. Now they are developing into what? Out of that six arch arteries, to make it like simple, to make it like very simple, guys, you just have to remember about the third arch artery. because that is the one which is going to form your carotid arteries okay third arch artery is going to form the carotid artery at least learn it now please learn it now they are asking repeatedly in your mc exam third arch artery is the one which is going to form your carotid artery it's common carotid artery internal external carotid artery then after that the fourth arch artery on the left side only on the left side it is going to form the arch of aorta ye to aapke exam mein pucha gaya tha it has been asked in your exam sir So remember, the carotid arteries are actually derived from the third arch artery, and only the left fourth, only the left to fourth arch artery is the one which is going to form arch of aorta. Of course, we don't have like double arch of aorta. We have only like one arch of aorta towards the left. So that is the one which is going to form. And then you remember about the sixth one. The sixth arch artery, it is the one which is going to form your pulmonary arteries, right and left pulmonary artery. the sixth arch artery it is going to form the right and left pulmonary artery but along with that which is asked recently last year only guys about along with that they have asked about the ductus arteriosus also and ductus arteriosus you know very well it is between the pulmonary artery and the arch of aorta and if it is between the pulmonary artery and arch of aorta definitely the ductus arteriosus has to develop from the sixth arch artery only why because sixth arch artery is the one which is going to form pulmonary artery so six se form hoga but is it going to form on both the sides no absolutely not why because it is combi combining along with the arch of aorta so therefore arch of aorta is present only towards the left side so remember that the left sixth arch artery is the one which is going to form the ductus arteriosus so my dear friends don't make this topic like complicated there guys i want my students at least few days before the exam to remember only these three numbers here that is 3 4 and 6 third arch artery is going to form carotid arteries left fourth arch artery is going to form the arch of aorta and remember the sixth arch artery is going to form pulmonary artery and only the left sixth arch artery is going to form ductus arteriosus being asked in your last exam kali pucha gaya like in the last year exam that has been asked so apart from this i don't think that you know azam sir is not teaching you here apart from this whatever remaining arteries is there like the first and the second and the fifth you can see dotted lines there in the diagram yes it is degenerated it's gone is it okay so the only thing you have to remember is about the third and the fourth and the sixth arch artery it is being tested constantly in the exam please take care about that is it okay fine uh. 
सर प्लीज क्लियर माई डाउट डॉक्टर पी के इज आस्किंग हियर एक्सटर्नल ऑर्टरी कैनल डेलस फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट ब्रेकिल आर्च और द फर्स्ट ब्रेकिल क्लेफ्ट सी एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड आर्ट एक्सटर्नल अकॉस्टिक मेटिस विल बी अकॉर्डिंग टू द ग्रेज एनाटमी इट इज रिटर्न वेरी क्लियरली इट विल बी एक्चुअली डिराइव एक्चुअली एक्चुअली डिराइव फ्रॉम द क्लेफ्ट द फर्स्ट क्लेफ्ट ओके बट नाउ डेज द रिसेंट एडवांसेस वी आर गोइंग टू कम अक्रॉस यू नो न्यू न्यू लाइक अपडेट्स आर कमिंग इन द एग्जाम गाइड्स सो इट इज बींग मैंशन देर आर इट इज डिराइव फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट आर्ट सो नाउ डेज नाउ डेज रिमेंबर इफ द क्वेश्चन इज आस्ड इन योर एग्जाम go for the first arch the nerve supply in the following shown muscle here sir like first of all you have to identify this muscle so i would like you people to answer me very quickly here this is the front view or the back view guys yes it is the back view and then <clears throat> this is the spine of the scapula here and agar ye wala spine hoga to above the spine there will be supraspinatus muscle and below the spine there will be infraspinatus muscle supra spinatus muscle and infra spinatus muscle sir and then you'll be having the lateral border here and there is a medial border and lateral border will be attached to two muscles here there will be teres minor above and there will be teres major below sir similarly on the medial side also there will be two muscles there guys one will be the rhomboid minor above and then there will be rhomboid major below theek okay? hai that is a simple way to remember above and below the spine will be having supra spinatus infra spinatus lateral border will be having the teres minor major and medial border will be having the rhomboid minor rhomboid major so in this diagram whatever this muscle is marked here that is teres major muscle and remember teres major muscle will be supplied with the lower subscapular nerve sir lower subscapular nerve will be supplying to the teres major muscle and teres minor though it is very famous one deltoid and teres minor together it is supplied by axillary nerve sir axillary nerve will be supplying to the yes deltoid as well as the teres minor sir moving on to the next concept hand deformity present as hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint metacarpophalangeal joint hyperextension and flexion at the interphalangeal joint occurs due to paralysis of oh so basically it is telling about the claw hand only theek hai na are you getting me so basically what is this one here sir claw hand and the claw hand yes the muscles which are involved will be the lumbricals as well as the interosseae the lumbricals as well as interosseae will be involved in the claw hand now the clinical diagnosis for the patient shown in the diagram in the diagram you are able to see here this is actually the omphalo seal guys omphalo seal the moment you look at this diagram i hope everyone will be able to tell it is omphalo seal why because yes the contents of the intestine intestines are actually lying outside and the loops of the intestines are actually outside and they are actually covered by that sac peritoneal sac so that is why when you have that sac remember it is omphalo seal omphalo seal not gastroschisis in gastros cases you don't have that sac there guys now now my my intention is not about this one here my intention is about the rotation of gut because it is very commonly asked in your exam mci exam so write down any notes there sir rotation of gut remember the four gut the four gut will be rotating 90 degrees in clockwise direction sir and then mid gut mid gut will be rotating 270 degrees in anti clockwise direction sir anti clockwise direction and whereas the hind gut hind gut will actually not rotate so the fore gut will rotate 90 degrees in clockwise direction and the mid gut will rotate 270 degrees in anti clockwise direction and the hind gut will not rotate actually now uh so once in your exam they have asked about the mid gut rotation how much it is rotating sir 270 degrees and second thing what they have asked is the mid gut is going to rotate 270 degrees anti clockwise around which artery common sense yaar which is the artery of mid gut mid gut is supplied by which artery there it is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery so superior mesenteric artery is the one which will be supplied in the mid gut and remember yes around that superior mesenteric artery what is going to happen it is going to rotate that is one more thing that you have to remember and apart from that one more thing that i want you to remember is that okay mid gut rotation what is going to happen the mid gut is going to herniate out that is known as physiological hernia mid gut is going to come out and it is going to come out via which opening there umbilical opening and after coming out through this umbilical opening then it is going to rotate anti clockwise direction that is 270 degrees in anti clockwise direction around which artery sir that artery is nothing but the superior mesenteric artery okay now you and me we are like very fortunate your mid gut my mid gut came out rotated it actually reduced back the physiological hernia reduced back and our, our abdomen is perfect right now but the, but in some unfortunate babies what is going to happen 
Yes, the midgut will come out, but it will not reduce back. There will be failure of a reduction of the uh, you know physiological hernia. The physiological hernia will not reduce back, and that is the reason why that is the reason why it is going to remain outside itself, and that condition is known as what's a omphalocele. So my main intention here in anatomy, remember about the rotation of gut topic, very important, revise that before the exam, sir. Ligation of the common hepatic artery will compromise blood flow in which of the following arteries? Oh my God. Another expected question for June exam. Uh, please write it down, guys, wherever you're writing, uh, you know, uh, in your notes and all. The blood supply of the abdomen, ab abdomen blood supply, the arterial supply is very much important and uh, you can... <clears throat> actually expect one question from the uh, all the branches arteries and all those things number one you have to learn about the abdominal aorta and branches number two celiac trunk superior mesenteric artery inferior mesenteric artery and most of the time the questions will be coming from abdominal aorta as well as the celiac trunk sir abdominal aorta and celiac trunk okay so ye bahut important hai guys this is extremely important okay <coughs> now now, uh, I'll let you know here, let us just uh, revise this one and the best way to revise this topic is actually draw the diagram. Just orally learning the branches will never help you guys. So, for example, esophagus here and the stomach here and duodenum, first part, second part, third part and the fourth part of duodenum here. Now, in the concavity of this one, you'll be able to see the pancreas present over here and pancreas is going to pass behind the stomach and finally, the tail of the pancreas will be lying in the spleen here, in the hilum of the spleen. And similarly, on the right side here, you just try to imagine that there is liver present over here, guys. Come on. Now, what is the artery of foregut? The foregut will be supplied by the celiac trunk. Celiac trunk is the artery of foregut. And celiac trunk in turn will give rise to like three main branches. So, what are the three main branches given to the celiac trunk, sir? Number one, that is the left gastric artery. Number two will be the splenic artery. And number three will be the common hepatic artery. Let us deal with all the three of them one by one very quickly, guys. In two minutes, we are going to revise the entire topic. So, please concentrate here. The celiac trunk will first of all give rise to left gastric artery and this left gastric artery will be lying along which curvature of the stomach? Lesser curvature of the stomach. And uh, on the way, it will be giving the branches only to the esophagus and these are known as what, guys? Esophageal branches. That's all. It is the easiest one. Easy one. Easy one to remember, guys. <clears throat> so, celiac trunk will give rise to left gastric artery going along the lesser curvature and it is giving like only one branch that is nothing but to the esophagus, esophageal branches. Number two, the second one will be the splenic artery and splenic artery has to go to the spleen. Is it going in front of the stomach or behind the stomach, sir? Behind the stomach. And that too, it is actually going in a zigzag, zigzag manner. So, it is one of the examples of your tortuous artery. It is going in a tortuous manner. Now, it's very simple. Don't try to mug up like, you know, like a flow chart or like a table there. It's very simple in our diagram. On the way, it will be giving the branches to what, sir? On the way, it will be giving the branches to the pancreas. So, these are nothing but the pancreatic branches. It's giving a branch along the greater curvature of the stomach. Along the greater curvature of the stomach, that is left gastroepiploic artery. And it's also giving the branches near the fundus of the stomach, that is short gastric artery. And even in the hilum of the spleen, that is a hyla branches. Sir. So the pancreatic branches, the left gastroepiploic artery, the superior gastric, uh, sorry, the short gastric arteries, and the hyla branches. Okay, these are all the branches given by the splenic artery. And now welcome to the most complicated one, that is common hepatic artery. Common hepatic artery, from the name itself, we can understand it will be again dividing into two branches. One which is actually going towards the liver, proper hepatic artery. And the one which is going behind the duodenum here, that is gastroduodenal artery. Uh -huh. So, let me repeat that again here, guys. Common hepatic artery will actually divide into two branches. One is the proper hepatic artery, another one is the gastroduodenal. And proper hepatic artery will be dividing into right hepatic artery and left hepatic artery. Right hepatic artery will give rise to cystic artery, which will be going and supplying to the gallbladder present here, sir. It's simple. The proper hepatic artery is very simple, okay, now. And now welcome to gastroduodenal artery. It will be finally giving like two branches. Out of the two branches, one of the branch will go along the greater curvature here. That is a right gastroepiploic artery. And then one more branch is given here between the pancreas and duodenum. That is superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. 
superior pancreatico duodenal arteries between the pancreas and the duodenum there will be superior pancreatico duodenal artery so these are all the branches given by this one and now now one more thing here remember very important thing here proper hepatic artery guys proper hepatic artery is the one which will be giving a branch along this lesser curvature and this is the right gastric artery so remember right gastric artery is a branch of which one it is a branch of the proper hepatic artery so there is a reason why i was telling you okay these branches you cannot just keep, keep simply keep the notes in the front and mug up you know don't just take the xerox notes and keep in the front and mug up that one sir no you have to draw it along with me in our you know class or in the videos and please don't even make up your mind that okay you are not going to learn these branches and all you have to learn these branches and <laughs> one more thing in your mc exam itself it has been actually tested as a image based question also so this was even asked as a image based question guys okay so ye bahut important hai ab yahan par welcome back to the question guys ligation of the common hepatic artery compromise the blood flow in agar aapne common hepatic artery ko ligate kar diya hai sir common hepatic artery is ligated so if it is ligated then the blood supply will be compromised to which branches right and left gastric artery come on yes a right gastric artery okay but not the left gastric artery why because left gastric artery is a direct branch of celiac trunk that is not going to affected left gastric artery should not be affected why because we are ligating which one common hepatic area mm -hmm. okay right gastric and the short gastric artery a right gastric artery yes okay that will be involved that will be the blood flow will be compromised in that one but not the short gastric artery why because short gastric artery is a branch of splenic artery right gastroepiploic artery yes the blood flow to this one will be compromised and as well as the short gastric arteries short gastric artery no again it is not compromised here right gastric artery yes the blood supply will be compromised here and right gastroepiploic artery yes the blood supply will be compromised here hai na so therefore the answer is d whatever whatever the question is whatever the options are it's a very beautiful question there guys but mainly what is the examiner trying to test you about here examiner aapko kya try kar raha hai sir test karne ke liye it is actually trying to test you about the branches of the celiac trunk like the branches of celiac trunk sir theek hai so that is one important concept by the way uh, by the way i want to inform you people that what i'm trying to inform you people that you have to actually study about the branches of abdominal aorta and the branches given by the celiac trunk for your coming fmg exam on 4th june 2022 that's very much important guys okay now now moving ahead with the next question here that is arrange the following in the sequence of spermatogenesis yes spermatogenesis i hope you know the sequence first you'll be having spermatogonium and spermatogonium will be actually followed by what sir they will be getting converted to primary spermatocyte then the secondary spermatocyte so this should come second and then they will be actually forming the spermatids and finally the spermatozoa so in this manner you can actually arrange in sequence first comes b then comes your uh, a here then comes your d here and then comes the c guys so one of the question which i have given in sequence why because i have included this in our discussion right now why because nowadays now even the pattern of questions is also changing apart from clinical questions and all they are also giving the arrangement of all, of this in the sequential manner and all those things theek hai na chaliye sir to please remember that and now now why why did i include this question here ye question maine aapko isliye include kiya hai why because yes <coughs> they can also ask you some other questions from here what is the location of spermatogenesis स्पर्मेटोजेनेसिस कहाँ पर होता है सर आंसर शुड बी सेमिनी फेरस ट्यूब्यूल सेमिनी फेरस ट्यूब्यूल में होगा एंड देन नंबर टू सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज दैट ड्यूरेशन ड्यूरेशन विल बी 72 टू 74 डेज एंड आई वुड लाइक यू टू अगेन टेल जस्ट बिफोर बिफोर योर एग्जाम्स हियर डेज डेज इंपॉर्टेंट है आई डोंट नो वाई इन सम ऑफ द फेस टू फेस क्लासेस स्टूडेंट्स आर इन वेरी हरी दे आर लाइक सेवेंटी टू टू आवर्स सेवेंटी फोर सेकेंड्स पता नहीं क्या रिमेंबर इट इज डेज गाइस and then yes epididymis you have to remember epididymis for your mc exam why why because this is the place where there will be storage of the spermatozoa this is the place where the uh, there will be maturation of the spermatozoa and this is the place where the spermatozoa will gain motility they are going to become like more motile 
so i hope now you have understood why i have kept this question in discussion over here there are so many mcqs which are asked from here so you have to remember for this one so remember the storage of spermatozoa <clears throat> will be in the epididymis and the maturation of the spermatozoa will occur in the epididymis and the motility it gains motility in the epididymis and the duration of spermatogenesis is 72 to 74 days and location is seminiferous tubule wise and yes in the options we have already discussed the the process of spermatogenesis like one by one all the stages we have already discussed guys so i hope this will help you next one which of the following finger has got two dorsal introsciae muscle guys let me show you with the help of this picture the moment you look at this picture here you are able to appreciate yes you will be having the you these muscles in between the bones in between the metacarpal bones that is why they are like interosseae inter in between osseous bone introsciae now how to differentiate between palmar and uh, dorsal introsciae remember palmar introsciae will be unipinnate unipinnate you can clearly appreciate that they are actually going to originate only from one metacarpal only from one bone but whereas dorsal introsciae are actually going to originate from the adjacent metacarpal so therefore this one will be the bipinnate bipinnate guys so how to differentiate between palmar and dorsal introsciae yes remember palmar introsciae will be unipinnate dorsal introsciae will be bipinnate number two they can ask you about the nerve supply the moment you listen the word as interosseae keep in mind all the introsciae are supplied by ulnar nerve there is no exception there all the all the introsia are supplied by alana and third thing is action action you know very well we remember with the very famous mnemonic as pad and dab palmar introsia will be helping in adduction of the fingers and whereas dorsal introsia will be helping in abduction of the fingers sir. palmar introsia will be helping in adduction of the fingers dorsal introsia will be helping in abduction sir okay na pad and dab pad and dab palmar introsia will be helping in adduction and dorsal introsia will be helping in what adduction abduction okay now now let us go a little bit in more depth which finger has got like two dorsal introsia you can see the insertion here sir this dorsal introsia and dorsal introsia inserting onto the middle finger that means middle finger actually has got like two dorsal introsia but middle finger will not have the palmar introsia palmar introsia are not present over there sir so first of all let us come back to our question here which finger has two dorsal introsia it's actually the middle finger there will be two dorsal introsia will be attached to that one sir okay but there will be no palmar introsia attached to that one so very nice we have actually learned about the action of this one we have we have learned about the nerve supply you know everything is done here sir let us move ahead with the next one here arrange the auditory pathway in the sequence from periphery to the center auditory pathway another very important topic and uh, yes nowadays they are as asking about the sequential arrangement of the structures from periphery towards the center auditory pathway and there is one there is one very famous mnemonic for this one guys you can remember as e co li ma in auditory pathway remember e co li ma sir e stands for your ear okay ear or even like you know eighth nerve the vestibular cochlear nerve <clears throat> and after that c stands for the cochlear nucleus and after that o stands for your olivary nucleus and of course it is superior olivary superior olivary nucleus l stands for the lemniscus guys that is your later lemniscus i stands for the inferior colliculi and from the inferior colliculus what is going to happen the fibers are going to pass to the medial geniculate body ye to aapko pata hi hoga we always remember like medial geniculate body and lateral geniculate body l for lateral l for light that comes in the visual pathway and medial geniculate body m for medial geniculate body and m for music music that comes in the auditory pathway okay <clears throat> and then the next one a here a stands for the auditory radiations here and finally it is going to the auditory cortex that is the area number 41 and 42 that is nothing but hazel's cortex also so these are all the structures we have already studied in our face to face class as well as in the doctorial videos with a beautiful diagram for the auditory pathways an entire diagram i have drawn there but for the sake of exam how to remember the arrangement from periphery towards the center is e coli ma remember this one this mnemonic here so now according to this we can easily tell here lateral lemniscus inferior colliculus cochlear nucleus and medial geniculate body i think cochlear nucleus comes first yes and after the cochlear nucleus you'll be having the lateral lemniscus yes 
and number three you'll be having the inferior colliculus and finally the number four the medial genicular body i hope you can easily manage with this one here is it okay so that is the arrangement of uh, uh, the structures in the in the auditory pathway from the periphery towards the center guys now the surface marking beginning from third to sixth costal cartilage third to sixth costal cartilage so this is the first rib here the second rib here the third one third to fifth now now why i have given you this question now from the last two three exams constantly they are asking they are asking the question regarding the surface marking of or the positioning of your heart the location of the heart sir and you can clearly appreciate in this diagram here <coughs> that from the sixth to sorry from the third to sixth cartilage over here the costal cartilage you are able to appreciate the right atrium present over here sir so this is actually the right atrium present over here from third to the sixth costal cartilage so whatever uh, diagram was given in your exam so based on that diagram what is present here so the right atrium is present over here now having said this one let us just try to recall like how is the positioning of the heart and what are the structures present at at all the surfaces guys number one in this diagram you are able to see the superior vena cava here collecting the blood from the upper half of the body and the inferior vena cava here from the lower half of the body and both of them are going to bring the blood into the right atrium from the right atrium the blood will go into the right ventricle over here and behind this you are able to appreciate here this is the left ventricle now looking at this diagram yes can anyone tell me what is going to form the apex of the heart it is formed by left ventricle apex of the heart is formed by the left ventricle and we all know very well the apex of the heart is located in fifth intercostal space obviously the left one the left fifth intercostal space what is going to form the base of the heart sir remember base of the heart is formed by right atrium in the front plus the left atrium behind and please remember if both of them are, are given the option there right atrium is contributing only one third whereas left atrium is contributing two third so agar dono bhi option mein diya jayega better option will be the left atrium it is contributing two third there guys i repeat again the base will be formed by both right atrium as well as the left atrium and if both options are given better option will be the left atrium guys then similarly what is going to form the inferior surface the inferior surface is formed by the right atrium along with the right ventricle along with the left ventricle you can clearly see here the right atrium and the right ventricle and the left ventricle there guys what is going to form the lateral surface the lateral surface is formed by left ventricle here along with this ear like projection and this ear like projection here is the auricle that is your left auricle left auricle guys theek okay? hai so positioning of the heart is very much important sir the positioning of the heart is very much important they are asking these questions a lot of times a lot of times in your exam in different different ways also sometimes they will be giving you a radiological image also in the last exam if you remember in the december exam recall questions if you remember they have given a transverse section and that to radiological image was given the scan image was given and in that you have to identify the chambers of the heart the right atrium left atrium the right ventricle left ventricle all those you have to identify so please 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 remember about this you know <clears throat> very much important here sir okay so my dear friends these are all the like important concepts that you have to discuss here or uh, you have to remember before going to the exam so i hope this session will actually help you for your fmg exam and i hope your preparation is going well so whatever concepts i told you it's not only about the questions guys it's all about the concepts which i told you here please try to revise them definitely the questions are going to come from here and uh, yes uh, god bless you all and uh, i hope your preparation is going good please revise anatomy and feel free to ask any doubt uh, uh, to me any point of time sir i'm along with you till 4th june uh, early morning when you're even going to the exam guys i'm along with you people so any time if you have got any doubt please let me know uh, i'll i'll be happy to clarify the doubt guys okay uh, that's all for today here like this is the session uh, that is uh, these are all the important concepts that you have to revise for the anatomy guys keep revising this one here and uh, if anything else uh, I'll, i'll i'll surely be in touch with you people you also be in touch with me i'll keep on updating guys okay so that's all for today thank you and uh, uh, thank you for you know waiting patiently for the session here yes in the beginning there were some issues and i apologize for that one guys uh, thank you for patiently waiting there and listening to me guys okay thank you all god bless you all guys take care